Hola, how's my wonderful people doing? Glad to hear you are doing well. What's on the menu today, I wonder? Could it be a flat earth video? <laughs> Not this week. We'll be taking a look at vaccines again. This video was sent to me a few weeks ago and I found it quite interesting. So what better to do than to check it out for today's video. This is Mike Adams here with naturalnews.com with breaking news about vaccines. News that will blow your mind. It'll knock your socks off. An organization out of Italy has completed the genome sequencing of some of the proteins found in common vaccines, such as MMR vaccines. Well, you don't do a genome sequencing on proteins. You do an amino acid sequencing. Oh, this is going to be a great video. And now we've warned you for years at naturalnews.com that aborted human fetal tissue is routinely used in vaccines. It's openly listed by the CDC and the FDA and the vaccine manufacturers. I'll show you the documents here in just a second. Right, okay, I don't think I've addressed this point directly before, or maybe I did. Anyway, specifically, we use the fibroblasts to develop vaccines. These fibroblasts come from an aborted 14-week fetus. At least that's what the MRC5 is, which is really what the health ranger here rants about later. These cells became very important in our development of vaccinations. See, viruses require a host in order to grow. They can't grow by themselves because the reproduction is dependent on another cell, which differs depending on the virus. Therefore, in order to develop vaccines for viruses, you'd have to grow them somehow. In this case, the MRC5 cell line is popular due to its ability to allow the virus to be cultured at a great quantity, and the cell itself doesn't pose a threat to the patient whatsoever. Now, anti-vaxxers love to bring up this aborted fetal tissue point, but what you are really doing is arguing from emotion. The cells were harvested from an aborted fetus, yes, but that doesn't mean it can't be a cell that can be utilized to better humanity. I mean, we use human cell lines all the time, especially in research. This is nothing new. If you take a step back and look at the situation objectively, there's nothing wrong about taking advantage of a couple of cells, which would have just died anyway, to produce vaccinations and save millions of lives with it. If you can provide me with an argument void of emotion that says using MRC5 is wrong, then by all means I'm here to listen. Well, this organization in Italy named Corvelva has completed the genome sequencing of these proteins in the vaccines. Guess what they found? It's the complete genetic code of a male human being. An entire human being's gene sequence is found in the cells that are put into the vaccines. Okay there, you do realize that every human cell, with a few exceptions, has the entire genome of a human being in it, right? If I just collect a sample of your saliva, I could take those cells and determine your entire genetics with it. That's just how it works. It's not that certain cells have certain genes, like the skin cell has skin genes or something and nothing else. No, that's not the case. Even if you put just one cell in the sample, that sample would have the entire sequences of human DNA. So why would this surprise you at all? I mean, if you only want half, we could use sperm cells, I guess. They are injecting you with the DNA sequencing of an entire individual human being who was murdered. A few more points I would like to point out here. First of all, it was an abortion, not a murder, thank you very much. And the fetus was not aborted for the purpose of harvesting its cells for vaccinations. That was more of an afterwards thought to take advantage of the cells to develop vaccines. Second of all, when creating these vaccines, we're not just, you know, taking the entire cell culture plate and putting it in. No, obviously the viruses are harvested from the host cells and then purified, which means there's no intent on leaving the human cells or any cells in the vaccine. But because purification isn't a perfect process, you sometimes would find fragments of human DNA within the those vaccines. And this is why it is misleading. If you eat anything, even fruits, you would find traces of another person's DNA in it. Whoever handled the fruit, or the fruit just being exposed to the same environment as another human being, is enough to get a tiny concentration of DNA on there. And this is very similar to the concentration you'd find from vaccinations grown on human tissue. What are you gonna do? Not eat fruits and vegetables anymore? It's literally the same logic. It's ridiculous. And an analysis of those genes has found incredibly high rates of abnormality in the genetic code, including 560 genes that are linked to cancer. All right, ladies and gents, you know what we do when people make claims like these? That's right, we go and check the source. Yay! Okay, so the article here is listed, Vaccine Gate MRC5 Contained in Prior X Tetra, Complete Genome Sequencing. Brilliant, isn't it? But we all know just reading the title isn't enough, so why don't we go into the body of the paper and have a look? Don't worry, it's not a long article. New generation sequencing have become the preferred tool for in-depth analysis in the field of biology and medical science, especially in high precision ones. Thanks to these tools, we can approach in a more modern and comprehensive way a number of applications such as de novo sequencing, metagenomic and epigenomic studies, transcriptome sequencing, and genome resequencing. This last 
last one is largely used in human field, both for research and diagnostic purposes and consists of NGS, next generation sequencing of an entire single genome to map the single nucleotide mutations, insertions and deletions of more or less long sequences that have occurred in certain locations of the genome, and variations in the number of copies of genomic genes, called copy number variants. You're probably confused on what this is talking about right now, so allow me to simplify. It's just giving an introduction to SNPs and CNVs, which will be important later on. These are both variations you can find in the human genome, or any genome of any species really. There's usually a consensus sequence of every gene, in terms of its nucleotide composition. SNPs are common substitutions that are found in a gene that is at least present in 1% of the population. Let's say a human gene is ATGC, but then let's say 1% of the population is AAGC. So in this case, there's a SNP at position 2 from T to A. SNPs are very important because they can be associated with certain diseases. For example, a SNP at position 112,998,590 on chromosome 10 is located on a gene called TCF7L2. This SNP variation is correlated with type 2 diabetes. So if we can sequence someone's genes and find that SNP, we will know that the patient has a risk of high blood sugar levels. There are a few SNP databases out there that is very helpful in providing information on these variants. You can easily locate one if you have the primary key of the SNP of interest. For example, the one I just named is RS790-3146. What about CNVs? CNVs are another type of variation in genes, but instead of having a single nucleotide substitution like SNPs, they deal with nucleotide repeats. Genes that have extra repeated segments or deletions of repeated segments are said to be CNVs. Huntington's is by far the most common example and involves multiple CAG repeats. This field isn't studied as much as SNPs are, but they are still an important variant that deserves attention. So this paper here is basically just saying that these exist and can be easily identified using the technology we have today. So far, the paper doesn't give me any reason to doubt its validity, so let's read on. I'm going to skip to the important part of the paper since in the middle there's just more detail on what SNPs and CMVs are. But since we're an expert now, let's just jump straight to the conclusion. The analysis on SNP, indels, which are just small insertions and deletions, CNV, SV, which is structural variants, on 560 genes chosen because they involved in different forms of human cancer shows in presence of numerous original variants. That's to say they are not even present in public databases, therefore are not known in literature. In other words, important modifications of genes known to be associated with various tumor forms have been identified for all the 560 verified genes. Furthermore, there are variants whose consequences are not known, but which however affects genes involved in the induction of human cancer. The human genomic DNA contained in the prior X lot vaccine is evidently anomalous, presenting important inconsistencies if compared to a typical human genome. There are several unknown variants, not noted in public databases, and some of them are located in genes involved in cancer. What is also apparently anomalous is the excess of genome that shows changes in the number of copies, and structural variants such as translocations, insertions, deletions, duplications, and inversions, many of which involve genes. The potential contribution of numerous variants not present in scientific literature and in databases to the phenotype of the cells used for growth of vaccine viruses is not known. Okay, so what does this say? Essentially, it identified variations such as SNPs and CNVs that we talked about earlier, and some of them were present in genes associated with cancer. Now, don't let the associated with cancer phrase scare you. Tons of genes are associated with cancer. See, genes always serve a purpose. Being linked to cancer is never its main function. Usually, genes that are involved in growth in apoptosis, for example, could become cancers if mutated in a certain way, namely the overexpression of oncogenes and the loss of function of tumor suppressors. And there are so many genes that perform that job to some degree or another. Saying that there are variations associated with genes that could be cancer-linked doesn't say a lot unless we know specifically what these variations are. And judging by the article's wording, they most certainly don't know what they do. Like the author said, there's no record of these in databases. Honestly, I wouldn't even call it SNPs or CNVs because by definition, they are common occurrences in at least a significant portion of the population. Since you've only tested the MRC5 DNA here, it just proves it was present in one individual and not in a group of people. Calling it a SNP or CNV would therefore be inaccurate. In addition, cell lines usually do have mutations and variations in them. They are stored for long periods of time, and oftentimes they have mutations purposely induced in them in order to make them immortal. Not saying that MRC5 cells are immortal, but that it's not uncommon to see mutations in these types of cells, especially in ones in genes associated with cancer. Furthermore, since MRC5 cells are used for viral reproduction, it's also common for viruses to be somewhat cancer-inducing, because they benefit in cells that have higher growth potential, which is a crucial hallmark of cancer. And since MRC5 cells here were used for that very purpose of viral growth, seeing variations in genes associated with cancer is actually pretty logical. Of course, that is a reasonable assumption, but we wouldn't know for sure unless we know about the genes within the viruses infecting the MRC5 cells. So in conclusion, we don't know what these variations do, most likely they don't do anything significant, and even if they are cancer-inducing, it wouldn't be a surprise due to the nature in which these cells are used for. The biggest thing I was thinking when reading this article is why? Why was this sequenced? It doesn't matter whatsoever unless you wanted to see its effects on the quality of the vaccine product, which you didn't. And if you really wanted to sequence MRC5 cells, you could do it directly on those cells instead of indirectly getting them from prior X. This whole thing just feels like an attempt to dig up dirt on vaccines, and I currently just don't see any purpose in conducting the sequencing project. So just to summarize the breaking news here, which of course you won't find reported anywhere 
in the lying fake news media. I mean, stuff like this usually isn't reported in media because it's not saying what you think it's saying. You can search cdc.gov and you can find mentions of these aborted human fetal tissue cell lines, which are called MRC-5. They took aborted human fetal tissue cells from an aborted baby and they cloned them and they put them into the vaccines. Nope, that's not right. They just use the cell to grow the viruses. And then when they are ready, they then isolate and purify the viruses out of the culture medium. So even if there are any traces of cancer-inducing DNA within the vaccine, so what? It won't harm you in any way. It won't damage your body. It's just DNA without the cell, after all. What's that gonna do? It can't even translate into a protein. The only way you could get cancer from injecting something is if you specifically inject cancer stem cells. That's simply not what's happening here. They are injecting you with the entire genetic blueprint of another human being who was murdered and who has hundreds of genes linked to cancer. Everyone has genes that could potentially become cancerous. It's what the mutations are that matter. So give me an article that finds out about what those variations are and then we'll talk. And remember that some of what's passed on from generation to generation is not just purely genetic, but epigenetic. <sighs> How to say this? There are elements of the mental illness and the violence of the murder and the suffering of that child that was murdered for his cells, elements of that continue to be expressed through the epigenetic factors of these genes that are injected into your children. That is most definitely not how epigenetics work, and is most certainly not how anything works, frankly. If you think genetic markers that affect expression of genes can carry down the concept of suffering, then I don't know what to say anymore. This guy goes on a massive rant about this for the rest of the video. Honestly, it's quite long and there aren't any more new points to cover, so I'll just leave it at that. Moral of the story, be sure to understand what you are reading and the context of it before you speak publicly about it. Alright, thank you once again to Fireshard for his loyal support over at Patreon. I'll see you next week.